Hi, and good evening. This is Jeff Adams from the Icebox Radio Theater welcoming you to Radio Icebox, Season 2, Episode 11, Blindfolds and Sad Farewells. And before we get on with the episode, do want to remember some of the wonderful folks that make these shows possible. Our patron of the episode that's on Patreon is Eric Levine. Eric, thank you so much for all your support of the Icebox Radio Theater. Members, we have three we want to mention this time around. Caleb Silvers, our very own Caleb. Thank you, Caleb, for your support of the IBRT. My good friend, Jerry Stearns. Thank you, Jerry, for all that you do for Icebox Radio and for audio drama in general. And Tom Sutter. Tom, thank you so much. We couldn't do it without you. And our super member of the episode is super indeed. It's Bill Murlock. Bill Big Train, thank you so much for all that you do for the Icebox Radio Theater. We certainly couldn't do it without you. Okay, well, the season is starting to wind down. Things are getting exciting in Icebox, Minnesota. So let's go right now to Season 2, Episode 11. It's Blindfolds and Sad Farewells on Radio Icebox. Box. The smell of spring is in the air. The sound of snow melt is everywhere. If you close your eyes and just listen, it's almost perfect. Or you could open your eyes. No, no, no. Don't do that. Just listen. We'll be back with this wonderful sound-only radio program right after this. What? Hi. It's Woody again. Well, looks like we survived another winter. Not that we couldn't get a blizzard last minute that would snow us in and starve us out grocery store could miss a single shipment, we'd be eating each other inside of a month, it's true. Anyway, probably won't happen. And spring is coming on, so think about fishing, why don't you? We got all the usual stuff down at Woody's. If you don't think we do, just show up for once. I'll get you ready for open water, late ice fishing. Oh, it's not too early to think about hunting next fall. Especially since having a new gun would be a good idea if anything happens down at the grocer's. Just something to think about. Woody's Bait Shop and Guide Service. On Beach Avenue in Icebox. Open alternating Tuesdays, 1 to 5. Plenty of ammo, too. Might want to stock up. You never know. Woody's! Good advice. No, it isn't. Well, we'll just see. What? Uh, we got a weather forecast over there, Cody? Yes. And the good news is it's looking like spring. Well, I don't know about the looking part, but spring is always good. Yeah. And the bad news is it's spring in northern Minnesota. Sunny today with a high in the mid-50s. No chance of precipitation. Nice. Tonight, snow showers and overnight low of 9 above. Okay, I'm beginning to see the issue here. Tomorrow, expect rain and 73. Seriously. Followed tomorrow night by clearing skies and temperatures in the single digits below zero. Okay, I think that's enough forecasting. I told you, spring was weird. Currently 37 degrees in Icebox, 38 up the road in International Falls, 3 above Celsius in Port Francis. The National Weather Service has issued a misplaced joy warning for our area as residents gaze out at the mud, dead grass, and sand left over from the melting snow as if it were somehow beautiful. Spring will do that to you. I blame the mold smell. More after this. The curse of winter is lifted, so it's time to get started on the real curses with Weird Sisters Floral and Garden's annual spring sale. All this week, come in for mulch, bedding plants, lawn supplies, and all the mummy powder you need to get your backyard apothecary ready for warmer weather. New this year, bound editions of Necronomicon are available in cowhide, pig hide, and mystery skin while supplies last. PDF versions for all your electronic devices are also available. And if you come in Saturday afternoon, there will be free hot dogs and balloons for the kids, plus a crystal love charm for mom, including one free recharge with purchase. That's Weird Sisters Floral and Garden, across from Graves Manor on Lake Street in Icebox. Time now for news headlines on Radio Icebox. This is Fern Newgrowth reporting. Area children playing in the woods near South Lake Street have reported making contact with the monster that has plagued our community for several weeks. The creature, described by some eyewitnesses as, quote, an abomination of Lovecraftian proportions, and described by others as, quote, real weird looking, is apparently capable of intelligent speech. The children claim the creature means no harm and just wants to be left alone. Although he did inquire about the possibility of obtaining a library card. 
The municipal library and liquor store said something could be worked out if the monster could produce proof of a local address. Police were called to the home of Major Rideau Tuesday evening to investigate reports that hot spots on the Rideau property were boiling the water in neighborhood houses. Rideau apologized to his neighbors, explaining that the hot spots, described as circular areas of intense heat without any obvious cause, were not created by him, nor does he have any explanation for their existence. The spots, which were apparently sunk deep underground, had intersected with water pipes leading to neighboring houses. Police warned Rideau to correct the problem as soon as he could. Rideau pledged to fix everything once he's gathered the necessary tools. But he wanted to wait until Saturday for the big sale at the garden center. Before you know it, it will be time for potato chips and fresh vegetables again at Lake Grocery. Come in today and mention this ad, and we'll take 10% off your bill just as a thank you to Radio Icebox. If you don't mention the ad, it's 15%. Also on Saturday, noon to 3, you can meet Lawrence Blockenspiel, maker of artisan charcoal briquettes. Lawrence combines different kinds of coal with materials like mesquite and sage, then presses them into a block and carves each briquette by hand. Come ask Lawrence questions about barbecuing and pick up some of his handcrafted, numbered and registered briquettes at just $10 a dozen. Kingsford is always on sale, 10-pound bag for 3 bucks, but don't tell Lawrence he's sensitive. Spring is here at Lake Grocery, where credit is available and the smiles are always free. And we're back. Oops. <clears throat> are you okay, JJ? Uh, fine, I just have to find the uh, 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 pencil. Okay, I think everyone in town wants to know what's up with this. What's up with what? Why you are wearing a blindfold. Uh, I'm not wearing a blindfold. <laughs> JJ, you knocked your microphone over. Of course I didn't, that's silly. If you're thinking nobody knows, you're wrong. People have been calling the station and asking about it all week. They have? They've seen you all over town. How did you do the news, anyway? I, I memorized it. And I'm sure people don't want to know anything about no, this. No, they really do. You can't do radio blindfolded. That's not true. You just have to get organized. Like, I have the control panel all memorized, and I know the music for the next segment is right here. No, 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 don't. The kill switch for the whole board. Okay, okay, I got it. It's, it's this switch over here. We'll be back after this word from Glorious Beauty Salon. <laughs> okay, that that's not the right you're, word. You're one switch over. I know, I know. Do, do you have the soundboard up? Yeah, but I think it's set to wacky morning DJ mode. No, 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 we never use that mode. It's right here. Okay, or maybe it's right JJ. Over. I got it, I got it. This is, uh, this is... I happy. Okay, that isn't it either. What are you trying to do? I'm trying to find the commercial card. Okay, it's just up and to your left. Your left, your, your left. That's not, wait, what happened? You engaged the special effects engine. Oh, all right, I admit, I admit there is some work to be done, but I'll get the hang of this. So now it's time for a word from our sponsor. Fatality. Not that word. Hi, this is Larry at Icebox Hardware. Happy to announce that spring is officially here, so the extra security is gonna be let go. Now I'm real proud of you all. We hardly had any incidents this year, and as a thank you, we're going to be holding a Bash the Snowblower event this Saturday at 3 p.m. We got a sledgehammer, and for just a dollar a whack, you can go to town on a Toro Snowblower, all proceeds to benefit the Special Olympics. Now, I know from experience that this event always creates a lot of emotion in people, so my wife has set up an aromatherapy area in the store over by the paint. She'll help you calm down, process all those complicated feelings donations accepted downtown next to the nutcase newspaper and thanks for not burning the snow shovel this year hi everybody this is jj coming on here real quick uh, before we head on to our next feature on radio icebox just to give you an update on that fundraising effort to get the pipes fixed uh we still have some work to do let's put it that way in fact we'd, we'd love to hear from somebody before the season is over no, that's okay. Anyway, so if, if you're not familiar, we have this little problem in the spring and the fall and, and part of the summer. Uh, whenever we get uh, uh, whenever we get the temperature changing ranges really, really fast like it does, uh, we end up with the, the pipes here in the studio uh, singing out strange vibrations. And we decide to set up this internet thing to try and raise money to fix the problem. Uh, and that's at uh, Audible, actually. It's an online service where you can get uh, audiobooks and it's just a wonderful, as well as some brand new radio drama. Coming up soon, X-Files. Uh, some of you 
that got DVDs here in town from friends from outside of town. I've heard of the X-Files. It's a really good show. And there's going to be brand new full cast audio of X-Files coming on soon on Audible. So it's a really good time to go and sign up for a free month, which we can provide for you if you go to Audible Trial. That's the word Audible and Trial Smush Together dot com slash IBRT. Uh, when you do that, a brand new page that just uh, tells you how to sign up for a free month will pop up. And uh, if you sign up, actually, we get a very nice uh, we get a very nice little bit of change, a donation for our consideration. So that's Audible Trial dot com slash IBRT. Audible Trial dot com slash IBRT. Get a free audiobook, a free month of the service, and upcoming, of course, brand new X Files stories on their way at audible.com. This is Radio Icebox. This program was recorded before a live audience. Take a well-deserved break. Well, we're back. You're listening to the Icebox Radio Theater, coming to you live from Rainier, Minnesota. This portion of our show brought to you by Boise Paper Company of International Falls, Boise Paper Solutions. We balance innovation with sustainability. And the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, building a legacy for the future. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we present to you Bank Robber, the trial of W.W. Butler. started. Please, Head, I've talked to you before. Oh, about what? Oh, oh fine. <sighs> the September meeting of the Borderland Historical Society is hereby called to order. So, the Harvest Festival uh, is coming... Uh, uh, <clears throat> what? <clears throat> what is it? Uh, next on the agenda is roll call. Oh, Amelia, th- this... The number present at the meeting is immaterial. The agenda says roll call. We should do roll call. Quite. Oh, fine. Amelia Butler LaRue. Here. Pat Starch. Present. Good, we're all here. So, moving on. Does the chair entertain a motion to accept the roll call as present? What? Say yes, Ed. Oh, uh, yeah, yes, the chair. Uh, whatever you said. So moved. Second. Very good. Well? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. We've explained, Head, you needn't hit the gavel for every motion. I know. I do it for therapeutic reasons. (sighs) I feel better already. So, first up, we have to talk about the Harvest Festival. Ed, don't you want to introduce our guest? Oh, oh, right. Uh, Sorry, honey. That's all right, Uncle Ed. Folks, this is my niece, Becky. Hello. Hello, Becky. She's doing a history project for school and thought she'd come observe a historical society meeting. (gasps) Very commendable, young lady. What area of history are you interested in? Well, the unit we're doing right now is local history, Rainy Lake in the region. So it seemed like this would be the place to start studying. Absolutely. Ah. Now... Patrick. I asked you not to call me that, Amelia. We should put our best foot forward for our guest. Let's let bygones be bygones. I don't understand. Did I say something wrong? Oh, no, no, Becky, it's nothing like that. I just think that until Rainier's society collection can be folded into ours, you, we can't deserve to be called the best local history source. And I keep telling you, Rainier's collection is not coming here, so you can just put that idea out of your mind. You know, the thing is, Pat and Amelia really like to argue. I don't see why not, Amelia. No, I imagine you don't. About anything. This isn't the time or the place. Uh, We should focus on our guest. I didn't mean to upset everybody. Oh, think nothing of it. No, that's just a 
discussion Mr. Starch and I have been having for a while. He thinks all the local history societies should be combined like some sort of hippie commune. And she thinks everyone should have their own little kingdom so that it's impossible to find anything. Oh, people, people, please. Well, it just gets my dander up. If only you'd see reason, Patrick. I asked you not to call me that. People. Don't interrupt, Ed. We're Indeed. having an argument. Then you leave me no choice but to use the ultimate weapon at my disposal. But there th- will be no discussion on combining the regional historical societies <sighs> today. And why not? Because it's not on the agenda. <gasps> Well, uh, yes, yes, um, I uh, motion to add. Uh, well played, Edward. Thank you. <sighs> Next on the agenda is a discussion with Becky about her high school project. Very well. I suppose that will be better than continuing a tired old argument. Another time, then. Yes. Let us come together to help this young person see the beauty of our region's history. Well said, Pat. Thank you, Amelia. Oh, is it a nice when we all get along? <laughs> Go ahead, Becky. Uh, tell us about your assignment. Uh, are you sure it's okay? I could come back. Oh, no, no. Things are as quiet as they get in here as they ever will be, so this is a perfect time to ask your questions. Okay. Well, our assignment is to focus on one event in Kuchichin County's history and to do a project on it. Interesting. I really like shows and movies and stuff, so I thought I'd write a short play and have my friends do it for class. (gasps) Splendid! Remember when we did a play in grammar school, Pat? Oh, Washington crossing the Delaware. I'll never forget it. Uh, So are you going to do the uh, entire history of the colony, Becky? Oh, no. That would be too long. We're supposed to focus on one event. Something, you know... A little interesting and exciting. I see. Have you considered gold mining on Rainy Lake? Or Kutchin County's secession from Itasca County? Or uh, the building of the dam at International Falls? Actually, I know which event I'm interested in. Uh, Do tell. I just hope you guys can help, because it's kind of complicated, and I don't know if I understand everything yet. The full resources of the Borderland Historical Society are at your disposal, dear. Uh, That's right. Uh, Ask whatever questions you want. I don't want to make anyone upset, you know. I mean, after what just happened a minute ago... Oh, that's just our old argument. Pay no mind, dear. We're like a couple of old cats howling on a fence. Ah, toothless cats at that. (laughs) Okay... Well, then, I think you'll like the event I've chosen. It's like the most exciting thing I found in the whole book. Oh, you're keeping us in suspense. Okay, I'll just let it out. I want to do a play about the Great Rainy Lake Bank Robbery. Oh, dear God, no. What? What's wrong? I, n- 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 nothing, dear. Nothing. Uh, no, of course not. Nothing at all. Uh, Be- Becky, cho- choose something else. Don't be ridiculous, Ed. Yes, well, the child is right. The Rainy Lake Bank robbery is one of the most interesting chapters in our region's history. Agreed. (laughs) That's the last time they'll agree on anything tonight. Did I do it again? Oh, Becky, you're a prodigy. I've seen people spend hours in the museum before they set these two on an argument, but (laughs) you managed to do it twice in less than ten minutes. Oh, no. And it's the grand champion of all arguments to boot. Edward, I have no idea what you're talking about. No, he's just yammering on as usual. Too few people know the story of the Rainy Lake bank robbery, and it is our duty as the historical society to pass it on to the next generation. Of course. So, let's pass it on. Uh, What do you know about the bank robbery, Becky? Just that the banker was accused of robbing his own bank. Yes, That's right. W.W. Butler was the man's name. He claimed a robber tricked him into opening his vault, cleaned him out, and took off by canoe. Claimed? Oh, no. Oh, no. That is exactly what happened. Oh, come now. We're not going to go through all that again, are we? Are they? I don't really see a way to avoid it. You see, uh, Amelia there... uh... You're too emotional on this issue, and you know it. 
After all... Oh, here it comes. Oh, there's no way you could be very impartial about your family. You mean... Amelia is a direct descendant of the banker W.W. W. Butler. And the evidence against him was purely circumstantial. And a whole slew of prominent citizens of Rainy Lake City signed a testimonial to Butler's character in the Vermilion Iron Journal, July 14th, 1895 edition. One of the most prominent of which recanted it all in a story later on. Uh, that John Berg character, Bosch. He had a weak chin and was known to drink. They were all known to drink. It was a gold rush town. Oh, Pat, Amelia, please. Isn't there a better way to settle this than arguing? It's always worked before. Yes. Don't fix what ain't broken. Oh, but Becky would really like to get her project done, and I don't think this arguing is helping. I'm very sorry. I didn't mean to upset everybody. Oh, it's all right, Becky. It's not your fault these two just can't settle a simple disagreement. Simple? My family's reputation is at stake. Which is why it's not settled. You were afraid of the truth. What was that? You heard me. You can't handle the truth. Is that so? Very well, Patrick. Hmm. You leave me no choice but to challenge you to the ultimate contest of historical knowledge and rhetorical skill... Surely you, you don't mean... That's uh, right. I challenge you to a mock trial. <gasps> Will Pat and Amelia come to blows? Will little Becky ever get her school assignment done? Stay tuned to find out. The trial of W.W. Duck Butler will be back right after this. And now, we return to Bank Robber, the trial of W.W. Butler. You heard me. You can't handle the truth. Is that so? Very well, Patrick. You leave me no choice but to challenge you to the ultimate contest of historical knowledge and rhetorical skill. But you can't mean it. That's right. I challenge you to a mock trial. <laughs> Well, I suppose we might as well stay and listen to this. Sounds like the weather's turning bad. Oh, you have to stay. Absolutely. Why? Well, you and Becky must serve as judge and jury for our trial. That's right. The fate of W.W. W. Butler rests with you two. That kind of sounds like fun. Uh, just one thing. Uh, what about the agenda? Uh, give it here. Amelia, you wouldn't. Hang the agenda. The trial of W.W. W. Butler must move forward. All right, folks. Pat, call it in the air. Heads. I knew he was going to do that. Heads it is. Your choice, Pat. I'll go second. I want to see what she has up her sleeve. Of course you do. You underhanded oh, the... Oh, that's enough. Each of you is allowed... Five minutes to make your case, followed by three minutes for cross-examination. Uh, Minnesota rules of criminal procedure apply. And if they don't work, Marquis of Queensbury rules, please. Oh. Retweet your respective rhetorical corners and come out slugging. This is exciting. Oh, this has been brewing a long time. I just hope they don't kill each other. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury... Does she mean us? Yeah, sort of. Uh, Amelia enjoys using her imagination. Inside her head, she's probably addressing the Roman Senate. I stand before this esteemed gathering to tell a tale of injustice and woe. Objection! Overruled. You can't object to someone's opening statement. But... Sh oh, Patrick, you'll get your turn. <sighs> Go ahead, Amelia. Injustice... And whoa! The year is 1895, and the place is Rainy Lake City. A gold rush town, filled with anyone interested in making a quick dollar. And into this wallow of human greed came a bright, shining light of civilization. 
I, W. W. Butler, do hereby declare what this town needs is a bank to allow all citizens a safe and equitable place to transact commerce. I will build such a bank for the good of all. Huzzah! So Build-A-Bank he did, and soon Mr. Butler grew to become one of the most respected members of our society. You are a respected member of our society, W.W. Butler. (laughs) Thank you, thank you. You've made this tiny gold rush town on the shores of this wilderness lake a safer, cleaner, and more respectable place to live. It was nothing, I assure you. Oh, salvation and Christian love has come to our town this day, W.W. Butler. Anyone would have done the same. Oh, brother. Indeed. Butler's presence in Rainy Lake City was seen as a boon for everyone. But as is so often the case in frontier villages, jealousy and spite are never far behind the sainted... Blast that W.W. Butler. Thinks he's so big with his bank, I'll show him. Wait, who's that? The robber, of course. You can't just make up a robber. This is my turn, and I get to make up whatever I want. Besides, the robber was never caught, so we don't know what he was like. We do know what he was like. He was like... W.W. Butler! Oh, your turn is coming, Pat. Fine. Fairy tales, that's what she's spinning. Continue, Amelia. Blast that W.W. Butler thinks he's so big with his bank. I'll show him. So, on that fateful evening in June... Ah, another good day of advancing progress in Rainy Lake City. I'll just secure the door now and return to my modest home to eat a simple meal and while away the evening, reading my Bible. Excuse me, sir. Are you the sainted banker, W.W. Butler? Why, yes, harmless person. What vital service can I provide for you today? Oh, it is nothing. I simply require change for this $20 bill, but I shall return tomorrow. Bosh, Flimshaw. It will take but a moment. Allow me to open the door. And open the vault. And I'll be happy to change that $20 bill. What do you want? Fives and ones? Oh, no, I think I'll take a bit more than $20, W.W. Butler. What? A subterfuge? Indeed. Have at you. Aha! I have tied you to a chair. To what end, you bounder? To rob your bank, of course. Fiend. And rob, he did. The New York Times reported on June 22nd that $30,000 was taken from the Rainy Lake City Bank. Posses were sent out. Searches were made. But in the end, it was all in vain. For Rainy Lake was still wild country, and the robber disappeared, never to be heard from again. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the defense rests. Wow, what a story. What a story is, right? Cross-examination, Pat. You bet. Amelia? Yes, Patrick. Ahem, uh, that was quite a story. Every word is true, I assure you. But my question for you is why you stopped your tale so early. After all, wasn't there more to tell? No, I think I fully covered the pertinent events. Ah, but you stopped your story after the robber escaped. Isn't it true, Amelia, that when the posse returned from searching for this alleged criminal, they discovered W.W. Butler missing? That item is in dispute. And isn't it true that Mrs. Butler had left Rainy Lake City for Duluth days earlier, where she was waiting for her husband? That was pure coincidence. Mrs. Butler went to Duluth to stay with relatives over the 4th of July holiday. And isn't it true that citizens of Rainy Lake City, the ones you claimed, practically worshipped the ground W.W. Butler walked on, almost immediately began to suspect him as the culprit... In a vile plot to rob his own bank. I don't need to answer that in accordance with the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution. Your Honor. Oh, tell you what, Pat. uh, eh, Maybe you just better go ahead and tell your side of things. Uh, Very well. I can't believe how interesting this is. Yeah, if I'd known they could argue this way, I would have made them do it years ago. Sold tickets. Permission to proceed? Granted. Thank you. Uh, My learned opponent would have you believe that W.W. Butler, the 19th century banker in Rainy Lake City, was beloved by all the people of the town, and I have no doubt that Butler presented such a sainted face to the townspeople. But underneath that face 
was another face. The dark, sinister mask of a criminal. <gasps> Objection! Oh, forget it. I want to see this. Now, insofar as my friend used facts, the facts she related pertaining to this case are uh, accurate. There was a bank robbery in June of 1895 at the bank owned by one W.W. W. Butler. And his tale of being tricked to open his own bank to exchange a $20 bill was commonly understood as the explanation related by Mr. Butler at the time. But beyond that, I'm afraid my learned colleague's dramatic and theatrical tale is in need of a generous infusion of the truth. Objection! Oh, overruled. You had your chance, Amelia. But he just called me a liar. Oh, well, you can call him a liar during cross-examination. Uh, now hold your water. <gasps> well, I never... Continue, Pat. Thank you. I have already stated that much of my colleague's story is essentially truthful if grossly embellished. But what happens after her story ends is what interests me. You see, there never was any actual proof beyond Butler's word that he was tricked into opening his own vault. Nor was any sign ever found of the mysterious bank robber. Given that these facts have now come to light, allow me to offer an alternative to my learned friend's story. We find Butler in the days before the robbery, a troubled and frustrated man, driven to the brink of madness by the imminent failure of his bank. Blast! I am at the brink of madness by the imminent failure of my bank. Quite. Whoever, whoever would have thought that banking in a gold rush town wouldn't be lucrative. What shall I do? What shall oh. I do? For weeks, Butler considered his options until finally he arrived upon a nefarious scheme. My biggest weakness is that I'm stuck in the wilderness. But I could turn that into my biggest strength. So, on the night of June 22nd, Butler packed up all the cash on hand. And having hidden it in a safe place, he ran onto the streets of Rainy Lake City. Villains, criminals, doers of misdeeds. What is it, W.W. W. Butler? Oh, citizen, my bank, where all of your money and gold is stored, has been robbed. Robbed? Oh, we are penniless. Indeed. But there may still be hope. Quick, form a posse and chase the bounder. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, everybody. Let's go. Yeah. Having riled up the populace of the town, Butler sent them on, his, on their way. Quickly now, populace. Your fortunes may still be saved. For vengeance! Huzzah! And they left. Ha! The fools. Now that the law-abiding citizens of the town are out of the way, I, laden with their hard-earned treasure, will head out in my own canoe, never to be heard from again. <laughs> and indeed, had Butler not been so laden down with gold and currency, he might have gotten away. But slowed down as he was by his ill-gotten booty, Butler made only slow progress giving cooler heads within the posse a chance to think things through. Hey, wait a minute. How do we know we're really chasing the bank robbers? What do you mean? I find it strange that Butler himself did not accompany us on this exposition, and his description of the bank robbers had a ring of fiction, if you ask me. Well, what are you suggesting, then? Oh, that this is a wild goose chase. I say we return to Rainy Lake City and question the banker Butler further about these events. Yeah! yeah! And when the posse returned to town and discovered Butler gone, the few doubters in the group were won to the side of justice. Butler was the robber of his own bank, and the posse would make him pay. Let's go get him! Oh, you, you betcha! betcha. <laughs> ah, if only my canoe wasn't laden down with all these ill-gotten gains, I could have made better time on my getaway. Butler, hold there! Blast! Hey, we want to ask you some questions. It's the citizens of Rainy Lake, and they're full of righteous indignation. So the posse caught up to Butler's canoe and forced him to turn around. But it was not until the fiend returned to Rainy Lake City that his true colors really shone through. We have returned to Rainy Lake City, Butler. Now, what do you have to say for yourself? Just one thing. Oh, what is that? Please, 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 please don't hurt me. I bruise so easily. I'll never do it again. Society is to blame. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Never have I seen such a cowardly display. Indeed. There is no place for you in our community, W.W. W. Butler. Oh, my advice to you is to make restitution for all you've taken from these fine people and disappear into the swamps never to be heard from again. 
You are more than fair, kind citizen. That is exactly what I will do. And for once, W.W. W. Butler was good to his word. I rest my case. That's even better than the first story. Uh, quite. Cross-examine, Amelia. Thank you. So, Pat. Yes, Amelia? According to you, W.W. W. Butler was dragged back to Rainy Lake City where he begged forgiveness from the people, gave them their money back, and then disappeared. Those are the facts, as related in the Ely Minor newspaper, October 28th, 1895 edition. But isn't it true that according to the Vermilion Iron Journal of June 1895, the townspeople actually sent a message to the Duluth police requesting Butler's return? That uh, may be. I'm not exactly sure. And once Butler, who incidentally was in Duluth to raise operating capital for the bank, got wind of the request, he returned to Rainy Lake City forthwith and of his own volition. Oh, one report does have that as And a... isn't it true that the Vermilion Iron Journal of July 14th, 1895 includes a letter of confidence and endorsement for W.W. W. Butler, signed by ten prominent citizens of the town, including the head of customs, the publisher of the Rainy Lake Journal, and the postmaster. Uh, I, I believe somewhere in my notes uh, there was something about... about and uh... finally... Isn't it true, Patrick, that the florid story you related about Butler's arrest and begging for his life was attributed to one John Berg? The same John Berg who signed the resolution of confidence in the Iron Journal? Uh, So? So, your number one source for all that bad stuff about my ancestor was a man who both signed the letter of endorsement for Butler and told fallacious fictions about him. I put to you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, can the credibility of such a witness be trusted? Well, Pat. All right. We'll call it a draw. Wait a minute. I gotta know what happened. We just told you what happened, dear. Uh, Yes. A bank was robbed in Rainy Lake City in 1895. And who did it is still in dispute. I don't think so. Oh, hush. But my teacher's never going to like that. I have to write up what happened and why. Did W.W. Butler rob his bank or not? And we gave you a definitive answer. You did? Yes. Uh, Current source material gives conflicting versions of the story. Uh, Therefore... Until more definitive sources can be discovered and verified. We have to call it a draw. Yes. But that's not how stories work. No, dear. That's how history works. So we'll never really know? Oh, oh no. There's always hope. Uh, Every day more artifacts from our past are discovered. Oh, we get trunks full of stuff in the museum all the time. And inside we may find a diary or a journal. Remodeling crews frequently find old newspapers stuffed in house walls for insulation. Not to mention official archives in Duluth and the Twin Cities, which are only now beginning to digitize and catalog their complete collections. If any of those sources, well... We may find a piece of information that casts light on the case. Oh, it's a whole new world for the historian of the future, Becky. But what about my school project? Oh, just write it up, Becky. You're smart. You'll figure something out. I guess. All right, are we ready to call this meeting to order? Uh, do I hear a motion? So moved. Uncle Ed, Uncle Ed! Oh, uh, hello, Becky. You're just in time for our meeting. How did your assignment go? That's what I came to talk to you about. I got an A. <gasps> That's wonderful! But Excellent. you seem a little upset. Is something wrong? Well, I wrote up the play just how you two did it. Yes? And then my friend Rachel and I performed it. E- yes? And, well, there was kind of a riot. A what? The whole school split into two sides. Half the kids believe Butler did it, and the other half say he didn't. Teachers, too. Well, that's wonderful. Excellent. I've never heard of such a passion for history. Yeah, passion. What's wrong? 
The whole school is coming down the street right now. They have to know once and for all who robbed the bank at Rainy Lake City. Oh my. Oh, 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 what can we do? Oh, I'll tell you what we can do. <laughs> Round two, that's what. Oh, Becky, take the shoe box. It's a dollar for adults, kids, 50 cents. Oh, Pat, Pat Amelia, warm up. You're going to have another shot at this. Ed, what are you doing? Oh, paying for a new roof for the museum, for one thing. Oh, did W.W. Butler rob his bank? <laughs> Only one way to know for sure. Fight! <laughs> the Icebox Radio Actors Guild, ladies and gentlemen. Radio Icebox will be back with the rest of the story right after this. It can be in the sound of the orchestra preparing, or in the sound of a sculptor working in stone, or even in the sound of laughter from inside a theater. It is the sound of art being created, and for over three decades, the sound of art being created has rung loud and clear in northeastern Minnesota. The Arrowhead Regional Arts Council has been encouraging local arts development in northeastern Minnesota through grants and services for over 35 years. Every year, they give out more than half a million dollars to local artists and arts organizations, and that helps create $40 million in revenue and jobs created. To find out more about our arts programs or how you can get involved, visit aracouncil.org. The Arrowhead Regional Arts Council, where the arts flourish you thrive. Come in, it's okay. No, you're having lunch. And no, I... no, come in, it's okay. I nearly have this worked out. Sandwich is at 6 o'clock, the apple is at 10 o'clock, and the cup of coffee is at 3 o'clock. Okay, maybe it's more like 2.30. I had a question for you. Uh, could I wait till I clean up that spill? I, I had a towel around here somewhere. <gasps> Sit still before you hurt yourself. I won't hurt myself. <laughs> Much. Oh, are you okay? I'm fine. I just need to sit here for a little bit. You ran into your desk. Yes. With a body part that's not designed for that sort of thing. That's true, too. All Mm. right, seriously, what is this thing with the blindfold? Uh, I'm just trying something. See how much pain you can live with? No, but that does seem to be part of the process. This is weird. And you are always one of the least weird people in town. Well, if I kept living here, it was bound to happen. Uh, You're avoiding the question. There was a question? Why are you wearing that stupid blindfold? Oh, that... Um, well, like I said, I'm I'm trying something new. You're lying. How can you tell? Something in your voice? Good. You'll do good in the new world order. What? Abby, please just trust me. This is something I have to do. Besides, there have been plenty of blind people in radio. They usually really excel at it. Are you saying you're going blind? Oh my god, JJ, are you okay? No, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Everything's fine. They're just, uh, this is something I want to do, okay? I, I just want to see if I can be a better broadcaster without, you know... Seeing. Okay, but if you're going to do this, get a cane or a stick or something. You're going to break your neck. I'll be careful. And if you hurt yourself too much, will you please take off the blindfold? I promise I will. This is just something I have to do. As you keep saying. Just be careful. (sighs) Something we all have to do. Shouldn't we wait for Sam? He told us to go ahead, and I wouldn't think you'd want Sam here when we get Rogers back. Well, I don't. Uh, I just don't want to be accused of something untoward. Such as helping a murder escape? No one has been accused of murder yet, gentlemen. Not technically, anyway. Now, how does this device work? Well, in theory, it should identify different resonant frequencies within the the duct that shouldn't exist together uh, and separate them into like and like, then split them. 
How is this even possible? That's part of the mystery of these ducks. Somehow, that creature contains the mass of both itself and Rogers. All we're going to do is separate them. Except that Charles told me that it will happen naturally. And Sam doesn't want to wait that long. We've been over this, Barbara. Will it harm them? Or even... Oh, no, no. I think it will be a relief. The mass wants to separate. We're just giving it a little push. Yeah, uh, about 4.3 gigawatts worth. Good heavens. Can the wiring take it? Uh, one way to find out. Ready, Cody? The readouts say everything's ready. Power is stable for now. All right. Barb, just put the duck down on that pad and step back. All right. Should I have eye protection? Probably. Ready? Ready. On my mark. Three, two, one. Charles. Oh, that was one cramped duck. Charles, are you all right? Are you... Good heavens, what is that all over him? Uh, Ectoplasm, maybe? Doesn't exist. That's why I called it ectoplasm. Nobody can prove me wrong. Are you all right? I'm a little confused. Where's Cynthia? I beg your pardon? Cynthia, my... (coughs) Oh, there she is. I don't understand. Thank you, my dear. It was most generous of you. Fascinating. Charles, (coughs) please explain yourself. Jealous? Well, of course not. Well, a little. These creatures aren't really ducks. I'm not sure what they are, but before we were separated by these gentlemen, cleverly done, by the way. Oh, thank you. Before that, we were quite intimate. Your mass occupies the same physical space as another creature's, and you get to know them pretty well. Well, just so long as you're here now, I'll help you up. Don't bother. It wouldn't do any good. Uh, Whatever do you mean? Barbara, I thank you for coming for me, and I thank you for bringing me back, but I'm afraid my time is past due. I don't understand. Don't you see it? Look at my face. He... he's aging. Right before our eyes. Uh, Hospital. We have to... Cody, help me get him up. No use, darling. No use. Oh, nonsense. We'll get you to the emergency room. Barbara, and... please. I don't have time, and I've got to tell it. Oh, Charles. It's all right. It's all right. Are you there, Mr. Riddell? Yes. You built these devices that make a person go back and forth between dimensions? Oh, my grandson and I, yes. Destroy them. Destroy them all. Y'all are in great danger. How do you know? I've been there. I've seen what it's like. Forty years ago, I was flying over Belize in my Cessna, and I flew into something. Can't explain what it looked like, but I believe now it was a portal through another dimension. The Bermuda Triangle? Uh, Near enough. Point is, I flew in the years 1975, and when I flew out, it was 2005. That's why you look so much younger. That's it, my boy. Or near as I can guess. I landed my plane in Mexico and started working my way north, figuring out the 21st century as I went. Oh, don't talk. Rest. I'm sorry, Barbara, but I don't have any time for that. I can feel myself coming apart. Major, what's happening to him? I don't know. We don't know anything about what interdimensional travel actually does to a person. (laughs) Charles, do you know what's happening to you? I'm coming apart at the seams, Bob, darling. I'm sorry, I must be a sight. No, no. He's returning to his age, his real age. There must be some relationship between the the resonance of the atoms in his body and the time in which he was born. Does, Does that mean that different times produce different resonances? Like, each time has its own signature. This is huge. This is gigantic. Cody, Major, please. Can't you do something for him now? Don't, Barbara, don't. Everyone's clock winds down eventually. Wasn't a man in my family lived past 75. I'm overdue. I only wish... Well, I wish a lot of things, but... I only wish I could have found you sooner. Oh, Charles... Cody, I do apologize for striking you like I did. I panicked when I found out you were looking into my past. So, 
you you really are I am the Charles Rogers who did a horrible thing in Houston in nineteen sixty five. No, Charles, don't. I must, my dear. I can't leave with that on my conscience, but it's unimportant now. You'll have to be on guard. You'll have to destroy that equipment. Why? Tell us. The other dimensions. I've seen things. Horrible things. They're intelligent beyond any measure. You cannot risk them coming here. Who? I don't know who they are or even what they are, but you can no more reason with them than a lamppost could reason with a fish. Different worlds, different realities. Can't let them in, Major. Just can't. Uh, I'll destroy the equipment. Good. Good. Now I... Oh, dear. Charles. Oh, dear, Barbara. I wish I'd met you a long time ago. I wish I'd done it all different. Charles? Charles? Oh, dear. Oh, my dear. Oh, oh my... <laughs> Grandpa, what do we do? I, I, I don't know. We have to call Sam. Should we destroy the equipment, like he said? Grandpa? I, I'm thinking. Every time we travel to another dimension, it ends in trouble. Yes, but the trouble is getting smaller and smaller each time. You, you can't be... I'm not going to pass up the chance to explore other realities on the word of a murderer. At least not without thinking it through first. Okay. Aha! I caught you, kids. Neckin' and smoking dope in my ice house. I told you, no more. Now, step out from behind those trees and come real slow. You hear me? Come out and show yourself. I will come out, but I do not think you will like what you see. Oh, I'll be the judge of that. Come out here. Oh, I'm in No, no. Oh, no! This has been Radio Icebox Season 2, Episode 11, Blindfolds and Sad Farewells, featuring Ayla McIntosh as Abby, Cody Boyer as Cody, Jeffrey Adams played JJ, Tom Bement was Major Rideau, Victoria Olson played Barb, and Justin Kapla played both Mr. Rogers and the Ringmaster. Our play this evening was The Trial of W.W. Butler by Jeffrey Adams, inspired by a true story. Originally recorded live by the Icebox Radio Theater in 2011. The cast featured Tom Bement as Ed, Karen Schickel played Amelia, Jim Yunt was Pat, and Jacelyn Sumner played Becky. Additional voices provided by the talented cast. Music was created and performed by Myron Howerlick. Some sound effects for this episode of Radio Icebox from the Freesound Project at freesound.org. A complete list of music and sound effect credits is available at iceboxradio.org slash credits. The Radio Icebox Playhouse theme is Monkeys Spinning Monkeys by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0. Radio Icebox Season 2 is made possible in part by the voters of Minnesota, through a grant from the Arrowhead Regional Arts Council, thanks to appropriations from the Minnesota State Legislature's General and Arts and Cultural Heritage Funds.